Hello and welcome back. I'm Dr. Mark D. Baldwin and today's lecture is on poetry. Before I discuss some of the characteristics of poetry, it may be helpful to reiterate why we're studying poetry. Several lectures ago I made note of the fact that since literature is art, it taxes our highest order of cognitive skills. Poetry is particularly ambiguous, necessitating that we detect the implications and suggestions of almost every word, phrase, and line. Did you know that many colleges of law require aspiring attorneys to take a class in poetry analysis? The assumption there is, if you can analyze poetry, you can probably analyze anything. Poetry should be appreciated as both an act of communication and a sensory experience. We should try to both understand and feel the poem. Since a poem is an act of communication, you should read the poem for its story or surface meaning. Approach it from whatever angle you can. Go with whatever impression you have of its essential action, theme, or plot. Formulate some sense of what it's saying. Then, when you dig deeper, Try to apprehend what the poet may be conveying through the sensory details. As T.S. Eliot noted, a poet's mind, quote, is constantly amalgamating disparate experience, always forming new holes from sensory data. Try to feel the poem. Follow your instinctive gut reaction. Okay, uh, time to get back down to earth. I know full well that the preceding remarks in slides four to six smack of Eastern Zen transcendental meditative sort of hocus pocus, don't they? Go with your impressions, formulate a sense, feel the poem, follow your instincts. Sounds like Star Wars. Use the force, Luke. <laughs> well, that's pretty darn fanciful. For those of you who don't feel it and can't use the force, let's talk basic terminology. Again, fundamental principles of analysis, breaking things down into their component parts, usually helps us to understand things better. So let's break down poetry into the following parts. The speaker, or persona, and tone, diction, metaphor, imagery, symbolism, prosody, and theme. The speaker, or persona, of the poem may be helpful in determining the poet's point or attitude. However, don't necessarily equate the poet with the poem's persona. You should also consider the tone of the poem. What emotions are being conveyed? Obviously, with poetry, more than with any other form of writing, every word counts. Consider each word's meaning separately and in context. Think about its literal definitions, as well as its possible connotations. What it implies, suggests, or reminds you of when you hear it. For example, one primary meaning of the word love is a deep, strong feeling for another person. However, when you hear the word love, depending on your experience, you may think that love stinks, as Peter Wolf of the Jay Giles Band sang or that God is love, or that you love Sally before she broke your heart. Or you may be thinking of Bob and how he surely is your true love. Connotations are often highly personal and subjective impressions we have of a word and not their dictionary definitions. The essence of poetry, of art, of words themselves is metaphor. The primary artistic compulsion is to make connections through representations. When we create art, we are representing the literal, actual, concrete world by connecting what we see or think to the artistic rendering of our sensory impressions. Whether in painting a picture, singing a song, or writing a poem, artists employ their mediums to connect the world, to try to make sense of things, to create something out of nothing. Words themselves are metaphors. When we utter a word, 
We are using the sounds of letters to represent things or ideas or emotions. Those sounds are not the actual things, but mere representations, metaphors of those things, ideas, or emotions. For example, the word table, when uttered, is clearly not the actual physical object with three or four legs upon which we put things. The word is not the thing, but rather is a metaphor of the thing. So when poets connect a few words in unusual combinations, they're attempting to represent facets of the world in such a way as to jostle our consciousness by defamiliarizing us with the world, so to speak, thus making us see things anew. For example, when Coleridge says in Kubla Khan, it was a miracle of rare device, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. He could be referring to the subconscious, or life's ups and downs, or even someone under the influence of a drug, as he sometimes was. Thus, the power of metaphor to suggest the paradoxical quality of life and experience. Quite simply, imagery happens when specific words or phrases in a poem produce pictures in your mind. Many modern poems exhibit what Paul Valery calls a drama of mental images, a drama made up of different and conflicting gradations of reality. When some object, place, or event takes on a larger significance, that's a symbol. For example, in the wake of September 11, 2001, many people, especially New Yorkers, now remember the World Trade Center as a symbol of America, or America attacked, or perhaps our innocence lost, or terrorism itself. Many poets, especially those in the modernist period, attribute the following four qualities to symbolism. A poem should affect a correspondence between the spiritual and material, in a poem, there are no ideas but in things. The poet should show, not tell. And the poem should affect an objective correlative. Symbolism affects a correspondence between the external and the internal, or the spiritual and material. Robert Frost, for instance, often uses a material object such as a wall, a road, or a birch tree, to distill a private mood or evoke a subtle affinity between it and the spiritual world. A specific object, rather than an abstraction, is best for evoking an idea. As William Carlos Williams said, poetry should express no ideas but in things. Note the wonderfully effective symbolism of the gun in Emily Dickinson's famous poem by the same name, My Life Had Stood a Loaded Gun in Corners. Most poets also subscribe to the belief that meaning should be suggested, not stated. They stress the priority of suggestion and evocation over direct description and explicit analogy. As John Keats notes in Ode on a Grecian Urn, Thou silent form dost tease us out of thought, as does eternity, cold pastoral. The objective correlative is the principle that a writer should present a set of objects, a situation, or a chain of events which will be the formula of an emotion. Here's an example from T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. What poignancy in those lines, when Prufrock realizes his hopes of finding a romantic love are gone forever. The prosody of a poem consists of its sound and rhythm. This rather technical analysis of the poet's techniques and tools often turns off the average reader, 
When asked to break a poem down into its metrical beats and examine its stresses, feet, and rhyme scheme, most people get quickly frustrated and lose interest. Much as the great American poet Walt Whitman criticized scientists for dissecting the sky with charts and graphs, when they should just look up in perfect silence at the stars, I believe that for our purposes here, we could do too much dissection of poetry and not enough simple wide-eyed admiration. Thus, I'm not going to get into prosody much in this class. However, I do ask you to read page 841 to 858 in your literature text, picking up what you can. Also in the next lecture, I will discuss Shakespeare's sonnets, giving you some insight into that specialized form. As with all literature and life, there are themes in poems, ideas or meanings that poets intended, and even some they didn't intend. Due to ambiguity and the inherent subjectivity of the poet and the reader, one poem may mean several different things. So, use your analytical skills to infer and deduce those possible themes, referring, of course, to specific textual evidence to support your readings. So, what should you do now? Well, read the poems assigned in the syllabus. Check out all of the notes I've given you and the discussion board for additional assignments and remarks. Thanks for your attention, and I'll see you next time.